Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Uh, today is March 7th, 2022, and we are now in day 12 of the uh, ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. And obviously the uh, fighting continues, uh, as, as does uh, the, uh, the delivery and possible delivery of continued assistance uh, to to Ukraine uh, by uh, Western nations. Uh, it's being reported now that over the last uh, a few weeks, more than 17,000 uh, anti-tank weapon systems have been uh, moved into Ukraine. Uh, these range from uh, Javelin-type uh, anti-tank guided weapon systems, the more uh, advanced uh, systems, all the way down to uh, uh, Panzerfaust III's in-laws and uh, a host of other systems that have been uh, handed over to uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, furthermore, we continue to hear about talk that Poland could be delivering these uh, MiG-29s uh, to uh, the Ukrainians. And I would say at, at this point, again, again uh, I stand by my stance in terms of the uh, cost-benefit analysis of delivering uh, those MiG-29s. Uh, I, I believe that uh, delivering those MiG-29s could, in fact, uh, push the Kremlin over the edge in terms of, uh, of what they perceive as NATO assistance uh, to the Ukrainians. And I, I, I think uh, we're, we're going to make the situation even more volatile uh, than, it, than it is currently uh, by uh, delivering those, uh, those fighter aircraft. And again, uh, I would say that uh, the, the anti-tank weapon systems, the uh, surface-to-air uh, man portable systems that have been delivered are probably more effective in negating the Russian invasion than those uh, those MiG-29s. I think the MiG-29s will have much more of a political impact and their effectiveness uh, it would, would be far less than the continued deployment and delivery of anti-tank guided weapon systems uh, which are far less noticeable except uh, actually on the, uh, the battlefield. And uh, with that being said, I, I believe that as well uh, could become a point of contention for the Russians where they look to eventually try and seal off that border. But the, uh, the Russians are, are definitely in a fight and they are, are firmly aware uh, that they are in a fight. Those, uh, those anti-tank guided weapon systems that have been delivered uh, have uh, caused a, a great deal of damage to the uh, Russian military uh, in its advance into Ukraine. Uh, we don't know what the uh, casualty uh, estimates uh, really are. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing anywhere from the Ukrainians reporting 11,000 casualties with the uh, Russians uh, reporting just a few days ago of uh, 498 KIA, I believe, and then about 1,200 uh, wounded in action. So probably someplace in the middle of that range are the uh, the actual estimates and at the same time the Ukrainians are, are absolutely uh, taking some fairly uh, heavy casualties as well uh, given the amount of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, bombs and ordinances that have been dropped on uh, Ukraine. Uh, but the Russians continue to ad advance again you know, we're in, we're in day, uh, day 12 of this we continue to hear about uh, what we continue to hear from uh, Western media uh, believing that the operation is far behind schedule. Uh, while it may be behind uh, some time sets with, in, in terms of uh, the uh, Russian timetables, uh, on a whole I do not believe it is that far behind what could have been anticipated by the Russian general staff. Again, uh, the, the, the penetrations uh, from the Crimea uh, up into uh, Ukraine have been in excess of uh, anywhere from 120 uh, to 60 to 90 miles, depending on what uh, entry point uh, we are looking at. And again, after day 12, uh, that is not uh, uh, that far behind any, any form of timetables, I think, that the uh, Russians were anticipating. I think outside of the uh, decapitation attempt in which they were trying to seize uh, the airfields uh, in Ukraine, which were unsuccessful, which then uh, brought a more kinetic ground operation into bear, that uh, 
I, I think the Russians are, are probably within their anticipated timetables, uh, probably on the uh, on the higher end of uh, their their operations into Ukraine, but nonetheless uh, probably within within a schedule. Uh, again, you have to look at uh, prior conflicts, and, and again, I'm going to harken back to the uh, German invasion of Poland in 1939. Uh, obviously, this map is 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 much different than the map that uh, the Germans uh, invaded Poland in 1939. The, the Germans were in Czechoslovakia, and they were also had forces in uh, East Prussia, uh, which obviously is, is no longer under German control. Uh, but the Germans invaded uh, from, from East Prussia, they invaded from Czechoslovakia, and they invaded from uh, Germany proper. And uh, it took in excess of 30 days for uh, the Germans uh, to, uh, to, to conquer Poland. And uh, at, at the time, I would have to say that uh, the, uh, the German military was, was probably the greatest war machine on the planet at the time, and especially uh, once it entered uh, France. Uh, a very, very capable force that, again, took in excess of uh, six weeks to bring uh, both France and Poland uh, to heel. So, again, in 12 days, uh, given the fact that, Pol that, that Ukraine is, is, is larger than, uh, than Poland, and uh, quite possibly, I would say, uh, if you kind of compare and contrast the two militaries, uh, the, the Ukrainian military is, is very proficient. And uh, I, I, I don't believe that, uh, that uh, some of these, these time frames of one to two days to seize Kiev and, and all these other nonsensical uh, predictions by both U.S. military, Western military, and, and obviously media analysis would, uh, would, 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 would uh, have the, the Russians conquering Ukraine <laughs> in one to three days. It's just simple, simply nonsensical. And uh, something that uh, uh, is, is just really uh, even outside the realm of, of even, say, the United States uh, in terms of, of uh, the United States uh, military capacity. If it were to invade Ukraine, hypothetically, uh, it's probably going to be very, very close to where the, uh, the Russians are currently in terms of, uh, of operating against the Ukrainians. Now, with that being said, uh, the, the the U.S. casualties would probably be far lower, uh, as again the the U.S. is more risk averse when it comes to taking casualties. Uh, obviously, uh, what we're seeing uh, taking place within the confines of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, uh, the uh, the Russians are, are not so much uh, risk averse. Uh, otherwise, they would have uh, uh, conducted uh, quite possibly the operation a bit differently. Uh, but right now we continue to see this, uh, the Russian forces, uh, basically uh, at this point, uh, they're, they're for the most part where they were yesterday. Uh, they continue to uh, use both uh, air power and their uh, heavy artillery, uh, multiple launch rocket systems and cruise missiles to identify and reduce uh, Ukrainian military targets uh, as they continue their broad front operations against uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, what would have been different? What would I have, have, have done different uh, as I analyze uh, this, uh, this conflict? Well, for one, I, I think that it was reasonable for the Russians to uh, deploy forces in Belarus uh, however, I would have not launched an operation from Belarus towards Kiev on the west side of the uh, of the Dnieper River. Uh, I, I'm not sure the force construct that was deployed was uh, supplied f efficiently, and uh, those forces probably were undertrained and had not been operating in the area long enough uh, to truly understand the environment that they were uh, they that they were attacking. And uh, that has deviated forces that could have probably been more successful uh, in terms of operations, especially in southern or uh, eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, I would have really have focused first on attempting to seize eastern Ukraine uh, as opposed to making this, this mad dash towards, uh, towards Kiev that, uh, that e even at the, at the beginning of this conflict, 
uh, I had predicted would would be very very high risk, uh, but high reward. But I think the risk and the the opportunity for success, uh, given uh, the size of Kiev, given the uh, the assistance that the West has given to uh, the Ukrainians, and given the the forces that uh, are operating near Kiev. Uh, the, the, the possibility of seizing Kiev that quickly was about 10 percent, and uh, that uh, that risk calculus was, was would have been just far too great for me to uh, deploy uh, set operation forces in an attempt to seize Kiev. I would have probably uh, deployed diversionary units uh, into the uh, the area to uh, keep Ukrainian forces uh, guessing and keep Ukrainian forces uh, deployed near Kiev that would lessen uh, the uh, Ukrainian force construct that was operating against uh, the Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. But the, uh, the Russian uh, battlefield commanders decided to take that risk, and I think right now it is, uh, it's, it's biting them in the butt. But uh, we continue to see uh, the, the Ukrainians uh, performing uh, very admirably. Uh, they're, they're using both the weapon systems that have uh, been delivered by uh, the West uh, to a, a high degree of efficiency. We've seen uh, reports and documented video reports of uh, the, the Russian losses, and yes, the Russians are in fact uh, taking losses. But again, uh, you, you can't equate the two in terms of the United States taking losses and Russia taking losses. Again, the Russian way of war and, and the Russian doctrine is much, much different um, than uh, the way the United States uh, conducts military activity, and especially uh, in its uh, risk aversion to taking those, uh, those casualties. And you, and you kind of see that from everything from both tactics to even the, uh, the type of tanks and armored personnel carriers that are deployed uh, by Western forces. Again, they're heavier, much more armored, and the crew has a greater uh, chance of uh, surviving uh, a strike against those armored vehicles than their Russian counterparts. Again, the Russian uh, BMP-2s, uh, BMP-3s, BTR-82s, BTR-80s, T-72B-3s, T-80s, uh, again, are smaller vehicles, less armored, and uh, we're, we're definitely uh, seeing uh, that come into play in terms of once those vehicles are hit, uh, they, are, uh, they are causing uh, serious uh, crew fatalities. Again, if you've ever been inside of a, of a T-72, a T-64, even, even the ones the Ukrainians use, uh, as, as a former tanker, uh, I, uh, I am greatly concerned. As, as a crew member when I am inside of a T-72. Again, as you enter the vehicle, you, have, you can physically see uh, ammunition stored all around you. If you're in the driver's compartment and you look over your shoulder inside of a, of a T-64, you can physically see ammunition that is stored very close to your body. Uh, unlike a, uh, an M1 uh, Abrams, uh, that is all kept in a secure uh, compartment in the rear of the turret with a blast door that uh, prevents that from uh, exploding into the crew compartment, killing the crew, uh, if that, as long as that blast door is, uh, is kept shut. And, uh, and, and obviously, if there's any uh, former Abrams crew members, you know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the circuit breaker trick. Anyway, but... Uh, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the the status uh, for right now. Uh, yes, uh, the the Russians, uh, I would say at this point, uh, appear to be somewhat stalled, uh, given uh, what is happening on the ground. Now, with that being said, uh, having bottlenecks and stalls are are not uncommon in military conflicts. The U.S. was stalled south of of Nazaria for some days in large traffic jams with, uh, with uh, uh, desert storms coming in as well that uh, prevented the United States from, from continuing uh, to move north, and it took more than 20 days to finally uh, to, to get to Baghdad. So again, day 12, 
and uh, uh, st still still very early uh, in relation to what we're seeing in, in terms of the capabilities of, of both sides, especially the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are a very capable industrial nation that uh, has the, the ability to defend itself. Uh, I would say that this conflict could carry on uh, for another uh, 60 to, uh, to quite possibly 90 days. Uh, and again, uh, that is probably uh, within the acceptance level of the, uh, the actual Russian timetable, uh, given the size and complexity of this operation into Ukraine. This is not an easy operation. The Ukrainians are, are no slouches when it comes to uh, military operations. They are much, much better and have been much better trained over the course since uh, 2014. Uh, compounding that is just the size of Ukraine with the, uh, the, the vast rivers that are in the country and uh, other terrain features and the type of terrain and the mobilization that we are seeing by the Ukrainians that are, that are preventing rapid uh, Russian advances and the collapse of the Ukrainian military. So this could, again, like I have, I have said before, could go on for some time, and uh, I would not be surprised at all if this goes well past the 30-day uh, the 30, 30, 30 mark, as I had predicted. But again, we will continue to monitor. We will continue to report and uh, deliver you content on this uh, ongoing conflict. Have a good day, everybody.